So we're starting with page six, <clears throat> page seven. <clears throat> So you just finished explaining what are all the five different weapons in a spiritual sense. Although we just finished saying that davening is b'charbi or b'kashti, the Tirgum and the Targum translates that to mean it's a Lucy Barbusi. That davening is like a sword and a bow, generally speaking. But to be more specific, it's Hamisha Klezaim. So, in a sense, he's saying that there are two weapons that are considered the most general weapons. And then there are other three which are under these two, but they're also separate categories. And they're all together five. The whole there, nevertheless, after everything said and done, that this is a time of war and we have five weapons. Clawless in a cherev shall twila, nikra cherev shall shalom. After everything said and done, it's still called cherev shall shalom, a sword of peace, and it's not referred to as a sword of war. What does a sword of peace mean? On the surface, it sounds like a contradiction of terms. If it's a sword, it's not peace. And if it's a peace, it's not sword. So this Lushan <clears throat> comes from Chumash and Chazal. There's a Pasuk in Chumash where it talks about, Pasha's Bahar talks about Eretz Yisrael and how we have to observe the laws of Shemitah. And then she tells us that if we observe these laws, then we'll have peace in the land, and it'll be it'll be a um, uh, a, a year that we'll see success in the, with the crop. And one of the things it says there is the cherev le'saver ba'artzachem, a sword will not pass through your land. What does it mean? A sword will not pass through your land. So Rashi says it comes from Gemara. That afilu cherev shalom, even a sword of peace. What does it mean in that context? That a sword of war means that chas shalom is an enemy that's waging war against us, against the Yidin. Sword of peace means that there's one country waging war against another country, but they're using Eretz Yisrael to go from one place to the next. So we're seeing soldiers walking around with weapons in their hands, with swords in their hands, it's not against us, it's against another nation, but they're passing through our land. So even though it's not war, but it's still not a very pleasant, peaceful, settling feeling to see people walking around with, with, with their weapons. <clears throat> I mean, whoever lives in Eretz Yisrael, they're used to it, but when people come, like myself, you come to visit from America, and you go to Eretz Yisrael, and you walk down the street, and wherever you look, there's somebody with a machine gun in his hand, <laughs> It's not a very, you know, settling feeling. So the Torah promises us that if you keep the laws of Shvi, it's not only <clears throat> you won't be experiencing the sword of war, you won't even have the sword of peace. So what do we understand from this? What's a sword of peace? It's a sword, but it's not actual war now, it's war someplace else. And that is dominating. So what is the war itself? When a person is eating, when a person is drinking, when a person engages in all the needs of the body, whether it's eating, drinking, whether it's other in your name, whether it's going to business, all these things, that's Cherish Because that's when you have to deal with your Yitzhahara to do things right and to eat food which is kosher, to make sure you make the bracha before you eat to eat in a refined way. When a person goes into the business world, that's when the actual challenges come up that I can make money if I'll do something dishonest and I have to be strong to be honest. I have to go to the business world and have to treat people properly and not embarrass somebody or insult people or other things that can happen in the business world, which we all ourselves, uh, Baruch Hashem, witness 
when you walk into a store, you know? Yeah, the lights are shining. So sometimes you walk into a store and you annoy the storekeeper and he starts screaming at you. And, and it, it's very offensive. But he's, oh, he's in the business world. So in the business world, you have to be, you know, calm and you have to be uh, treating people with the same medias tables like any place else. But that's where the challenges are. When I sit in shul with the talus over my head, there aren't any challenges. Not these challenges. It's me in a holy place, with the talus over my head, close my eyes, I'm davening. I'm not dealing with all these yetzaharas. So the war itself is when I go out there and I'm actually com being confronted by all these challenges. But in the davening, I'm preparing for it. So the davening is called cherev shal shalom, a sword of peace. And when I go out there, that's the sword of war. <clears throat> Right. After davening is over. And then I go out there into the world. Out into the world is a general term, but it means everything physical, material that I engage with is out into the world. Here he's, he's talking primarily about eating. But from this, we'll understand that applies to anything else that's also Kashmir's and material. Says in the Zohar, Namo apum charbo lecho. We eat bread. Nama in Aramaic is bread. Charba in Aramaic is a sword, like cherub. Lecho is like the Hebrew word achila. And it means we eat bread with a sword. I haven't seen too many people eating bread with a sword, but of course, it's a figurative way of speaking. That Shas Achila, the time of eating is a Shas Mocham, is a war. Everything is a war. Everything is a war. <laughs> Welcome to Elam Haza. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom is not war, it's Shalom, it's peace. <laughs> Davening is peace, learning is peace. So <clears throat> it actually says, I think it's about the Rebbe's father, that when he ate, of course, the proper way to eat is with a fork and a spoon and, and, a, and a knife. But he used to say that he uses the knife because as Zohar says, Nama pum khar it, you, that, was the, that was the sort of the figurative sword. What's the war here when the person's eating? Kidu, it's known. The whole, you know, achila, the of eating is a vara nitsutsus. There's no signs and Mendes and then Machakalate and a bull from Bun that talks about beer and tzutzis. It's all about how good the food tastes. But in the Zayar, it says it's all about elevating the sparks in the food. Which sparks? The tzutzis, the tayhu, the sparks of the world of tayhu. Shanoflu Bahamaychu. These sparks that come from a very high place, the world of tayhu. I already gave out the sheet in the previous mind. I don't know if everybody was here when we did that, but I made some more copies. Those of you who don't have it, this was the sheet that we gave out, if you remember. And if anybody doesn't have a copy, you can take a copy. Yeah. So this, this is just a very basic uh, diagram of, of where things come from. So everything down here in this world comes from the upper world, the spiritual world, but the difference is like this. Here you have three things on the bottom, mitzvahs, permissible things, and then treif. Mitzvahs, they come from atzilus. What? They come from atzilus, higher up from keser, in the infinite light of Hashem, and that's the ultimate source of anything which is a mitzvah, kedusha, a sefer Torah, a shul, beis hamikdash, a mezuzah, tefillin, anything that's holy, anything that's a mitzvah comes from this place, atzilus. And higher than atzilus is kesem. The next column, it says permissible things. It's not a mitzvah, but it's not an aver, it's not something, but it's something physical, like, like food and all the other physical objects. They come from a higher place from the world of Tohu. What about Treif? 
tray, because it's fell on the lowest, it comes from the highest place, which means in the world of Tohu, it comes from even a higher place. So here he's talking about not tray, but he's talking more about the middle, permissible things. That when I'm eating food, the real deeper spiritual intention is that there's a spark of the world of Tohu in the food, a spark of godliness. That spark is buried. So depending on how I eat, that will determine whether I elevate the spark or not. I mean, think of it this way. Let's say there's a person that by nature has a very special, unique talent. Talent in art, talent in music, talent in singing. And no one notices it. No one knows about it. Not parents, not teachers. And it's never developed. So it doesn't go away. That talent is there. The person that has the ability and the potential to be a brilliant artist or a brilliant singer or a brilliant dancer, but it's in potential. If I deal with this person the proper way, which means I realize, wow, there's a treasure here. And as a teacher, I talk to the child and then I give the child certain exercises and I work with the child to develop that talent, then that hidden potential comes out on the open. And this person is gonna become a brilliant singer, a brilliant uh, musician or a brilliant Torah scholar because I developed the talent. So basically the same as here. In food, there's a godly spark, a spark of godliness, which is something totally different than what I see. When I look and I see a piece of meat or I see a piece of bread, and that God is part, depending if I focus on it and I try to develop it, I could bring it out. If I don't, it gets buried. How do I develop it? So being that it's a God is part, it's basically by doing what you're supposed to do according to Tony. I make a bracha before, I break a bracha after. When I'm eating it, I'm eating with the right intentions. So let's look inside. Hold in your achila. What is eating all about? The varim of tzutzis, to elevate the sparks of toihu from the world of toihu, shenoflu b'hamaychu. Hashem, tzutzis, hamizbarim, when I do elevate those sparks, not only I'm elevating the spark, but it has an impact on me. Baisifin chayez b'ha'adam. This actually has an effect on upgrading and uplifting my spiritual status by eating the food with the right intention. Why is that? It's in Chazal. Zel Shomra Zal in Gemara Bracha says, "Bizman shebeis hamigdash kayom." When the beis hamigdash was standing, hamizbeach mechaper. The mizbeach brought atonement. If a person committed a sin, they brought a carbon. They brought it to the mizbeach, and by bringing the carbon on the mizbeach, their sin was forgiven. Achshav. Now, when there is no beis hamigdash. Shulchan and Shaladah Mechapra, the table in your home brings atonement. So the table in my kitchen, my dining room, is in a sense like a Mizbeach. We know that every person has to build his own personal base of English. So I have a personal base of English in my heart. And my home is like a base of English. So there's something in the home which corresponds to the Mizbeach, something that corresponds to the Kodesh HaKadoshim, something that corresponds <coughs> To the Ketoris, everything in the Mizbeach, in the Besamikdash, literally has something spiritual in the home. What is it in the home that's in place of a Mizbeach, the table where I eat? On the surface, this is shocking. Mizbeach is something very unique, special halachas, it's put in a special place. In fact, if you ever learn the laws of the Rambam, Regarding the Beis Hamikdash, he writes not only is the Beis Hamikdash in general in a very precise location, but the Mizbeach is an extremely precise location. What's the location? The location is this is the same exact spot that Avraham Avinu built the Mizbeach for the Akedah, and this is the same exact spot that Noach, when he brought a carbon after the Mabel, was in that spot. And this is the same exact spot that Cain and Hevel brought a carbon. And the same exact spot that Odin brought a carbon. And then he goes and says, not only that, this is the spot where Hashem took the earth to create man. So, okay, that's the Mizbeach. It's a holy place, not just a holy place, a place that is nothing like it in the entire world. 
Then I go and I bring a carbon, which is something in the Chumash with special halachas and the Kohanim and all the holiness that's attached to it. And that brings a Tomen that I can understand. I'm sitting in my kitchen. I go to Kingston Avenue, buy simple bread. I put it on my simple table. I make a bracha and it's doing the same thing as Bech. How's that possible? <laughs> What is it in the bread or the meat or the other food that I'm eating that can bring atonement? How can that happen? What's the connection? <laughs> let's go back to, let's see, what is it about the mezbeah that brings atonement? And then we'll see how there's something similar in the table, in the humble table in my humble house. You know, the mash must be mechaper. Of course, this is a very, very big subject in Chassidus, and after all, korbanis, korbanis is something which is a major part of Yiddishkeit. This is a major part of a base amikdash, and there has to be a lot of depth to it and the tremendous secrets to it, and especially in Chassidus and Kabbalah. There's so much that is explained. I once had someone who gave me this argument, obviously she read it somewhere, that really carbonus is something, not a nice thing to do, to kill an animal. But being that the people who worshipped idols used to do that, and Hashem saw that we can't sort of let go of the old customs, so he let us also bring carbonus. What? The Rambam says it. And, and the same Rambam that says that in his book called Morin Nebuchim, the guide for the perplexed, when it comes to the halachas, the Rambam says this is one of the chukim, which is beyond our human understanding. <laughs> so basically, when the Rambam writes a book for the perplexed, he writes something for them where unfortunately they don't have a deep understanding of Torah and Yiddishkeit, so something that they can hold on to. But when the Raman writes his Sefer, which is the proper Sefer of Halacha, he writes, this is one of the chukims, which means something beyond human understanding. In Chassidus and Kabbalah, it does explain a little bit, and that's what he's explaining here. I mean, as someone who has any kind of understanding of Torah, has to, even without doing the research, is that, is that where we understand it? That really, the whole Yiddish guy revolved around the Beis HaMikdash, three times a year, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot, we're constantly davening Yiratz and the Hashi, Bona Beis HaMikdash, B'mei B'yameinu, and what is it all about? Bringing sacrifice, which in essence is like idol worship, but Hashem wanted to appease us. There's no way a person who has an understanding of Hashem and Torah mitzvahs can be satisfied with such an answer. So obviously it's something very deep, and a uh, famous quote from Rabbeinu Bechayim, where it's always very often quoted in Chassidus, his words, Raza de Kurbana, Ola ad Raza de Ensov. The secret, the mystical secret in Karbanas goes all the way up to the infinite light of Hashem. And here he explains that just a little bit. What does he say? You take a physical behema. Where is the root? Where is the source of the physical behavior, the animal? It's from the world of Tayu. It's one of those things that come from the world of Tayu. And the world of Tayu is higher than the world of Tikkun. So again, when we say Tikkun, we're referring to here at Silas. When we say Tayu, it's all the way here above at Silas, above Kesar. And that's the source where physical objects which are either um, inanimate or either tomeach, which is things that are in the um, plant kingdom or animals in the animal kingdom. They all come from the world of Toyo. But they fell and they descended to a very low level. So down here, they're animals or inanimate or plants, but the source where it's coming from is a very high place. By day, when a person goes to the base of Migdosh, and brings a carbon, yes, sure, as we said before, with all the halachas and all the intricate details, how to bring a carbon in this holy place with holy people, which is kahanim and levim and everything else that goes on. What you're accomplishing is mailim oiso the shoshab oilam hatayu. You're actually extracting the spark of godliness in this animal. And by doing that, you're elevating that spark and reconnecting it to its original source. 
So initially, this is what happened. There's something over here, and it fell from here all the way down here. When we're being a carbon, we're doing the opposite. We're taking the spark that's down here, and we're elevating it to go all the way up here, going all the way up, back to its source. It reconnects to its source. Of course, we're not talking about physical space. And we say up and down, we're not talking about uh, miles or, or uh, light years. It's a spiritual distance and it's a spiritual up and spiritual down. So what's happening is I'm drawing down this light from the world of Tohu. And the light of the world of Tohu is much higher than the world of Tikkun. By day, I've said that already. So what I'm accomplishing is this light, which initially, remember we had the whole class on this, this light, which initially is too high to come into this world, but now that Hashem created the world, created in the, the objects that have the spark of Tohu, and we go through the whole process, now we can bring the light of Tohu down in this world and it's contained, and the world doesn't fall apart like it did initially. But that's through the process of bringing a carbon. So to make it less complicated, in simple words, when I bring a carbon, I'm drawing down a light of Hashem that's higher than Atzilus, Bria, Yitzira, Asiya, higher than Keser. It's from the highest, most infinite world that exists. And what's the benefit of that? And the benefit is, yes, there is a Toyim, the Milo, Milo, Pchinus, Atikon, because the worlds of Toyim are higher than the world of Tikon. Therefore, this will be able to compensate and fill and, and replace that defect that took place because of the Averis. You might remember we had a lesson on this during Tishrei when we spoke about Tshuva. And this is the way it's explained in Chassidus, that this is what happens when a, how a person does tshuva. When a person does an avera, we call it a pagam. Anyone remember what pagam is? Pagam? A defect, right. A defect where? Somewhere in the spiritual realm. First of all, it's a defect in my neshama, and it's also a defect in the spiritual realm, specifically in the name of Hashem. There's four letters, Yud, Ke, Vav, Ke. And each avera that I do or I don't do, is causing a defect in one of Hashem's names. And, and uh, that defect is like, a, like physically, like an, an injury. When it's an injury, you want to look to do something to correct it. So how do we correct it? When we draw down a light of Hashem, the defect is here in Atsilas, in this world. But when I bring down a light from Hashem from a world that's infinitely higher, that sort of fills all the gaps and that uh, corrects all the damage and everything is back into place there it was before. And for this, there's a mushal that naturally like all mushal, there's much more depth to it, but this is the common mushal that's brought in my marim, that if there is a well that dries up or a river that dries up, sometimes there are rivers that dry up and a well that dries up, what do you do? So you're supposed to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. If you dig deep enough, you'll find water again. And when you dig deep enough, the water from the deepest depth will rise and fill up the well again and fill up the river again. So Baruch Nisa means this dried up. I did an Avera and I caused something to be missing now. Some, there's a deficiency here. Something is lacking. So I dig deeper. I draw down the light from Eulah, Mahatoya, which is infinite. And when that's drawn down, it fills every single area that was missing. Spiritually. Generally speaking, the Bagam is in Atsilus. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's so much details to this, and some things affect lower worlds, but I guess ultimately everything has at least a ripple effect up until the world of Atsilus. <coughs> Okay, do as it's known, the li yais mili hachesarin, in order to fill whatever is lacking, tzarchlis ade gili er elyein davke. I have to bring out a light that's higher. The zeis ade gili er is a tayu, ade zem is smala hachesarin. When I bring down the light of tayu, 
I'm able to fill that gap, whatever is missing, whatever is deficient, is no longer deficient because of the light of turn. That's what it means that my sin was forgiven because the damage that I did and the injury that I caused was corrected. And that's what it means that the Mizbeach brings forgiveness. And the same principle applies to a person on a personal level. The same principle applies to me with me eating my personal food on my personal table. In order to explain this, he starts off with a question. How is it possible that a person, a human being, who's superior to everything else in creation, where am I getting my highest from? I'm becoming a recipient of the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, that animals and plants are giving me life, they're supporting me, and they're providing me with what I need. Adam belongs to the highest category, which is Medaber. And the Adam is so much higher than the level of plants and animals. How is it possible to receive highest? By definition, when you say receiving highest, the one who provides that highest has to be higher. And uh, they're superior to me, so they can give me something that I'm missing. But animals and plants, and certainly things that are daimim, no life at all, are lower than me. How could they give me chayas? So the answer is true, they are lower, but shorsham, the root, those, those words <laughs> spell tzameach b'chayim. The plants and the animals, Shosham, their spiritual roots are higher than the person. The person comes from Tikkun, and Tzameh B'chai comes from Tayyum. Shekodam the Mailela Tikkun, that's a much higher level than the world of Tikkun. Elishanafro the Mata. This is one of the confusing things, but eventually you can get it straightened out that there are things that are lower come from a source that's higher. So, the confusing thing, so is it lower or higher? Let me say again, it's lower, but it comes from a place that is higher. So an animal is definitely inferior to a human being. We don't need to be, have a rocket scientist to figure that out. But the spiritual source of an animal, where it comes from the spiritual realm, is from a higher place than a human being. So also it's a Also it's a Not only also, but actually the order is the reverse. The main comes from the highest because it has no life at all, it fell the lowest. Tzemeach comes from high, but not as high because it has life. Animals <laughs> is not as high because it has more life. And the human, which is the highest on the ladder, comes from the lowest place, which is Tikkun. But Tzemeach, Chai, and Demim come from Tohu. I remember I was once teaching a group of kids and Chassidus was new to them, and somehow this subject came up. They were sitting by his table eating supper. And one kid says, this food, nah, it's disgusting. And the other kid says, hey, take it easy, look at respect. This food has a higher source than you do. <laughs> okay, I guess they got it. <laughs> So when a person eats the food, the Shem Shemayim means for a meaningful purpose, for, for serving Hashem. And he makes a bracha on the food, before he eats it, and after eating it, so there's three things involved. One is the bracha before, one is the bracha after, and the other is the eating itself should be in a refined way. The sparks in the world of Toyu become elevated, the sparks that are in the food. And these sparks, because I'm elevating them, I sort of absorb these sparks. So these sparks actually 
give me more chayas because I don't have that level from the high world of Tayo within me. It's similar to what we learned about an Nesayin, if you remember the same idea, that a person overcomes a Nesayin and the spark that's in the sun is from such a high source, actually even higher than the food. And I absorb it because I elevated it. And through that, I could reach a level of spiritual heights and serving Hashem that without this, even davening and learning wouldn't give me that high level. So let's get to the food. That's where it is. The sparks that are gonna bring the highest elevation is in the food. But I guess in order to be able to eat the food the right way, we have to daven and learn. But Sorry, yeah. I'm getting to it, yeah. <laughs> He's going to talk about that. And we have to explain, because many times people walk away with these words. It's in Tanya, it's in the Maimorium. And, I, and uh, in our generation, things are different. Uh, how can things be different? Torah doesn't change, but things are different. And I'll try to explain that. So therefore, um, if anyone is going to walk away learning this mime and think, okay, from now on, that's it. Anything that tastes good, I will not touch it. I'll stay Donald Amos away from it. And uh, I only eat food for Hashem purposes. It's not an Aveda that applies to us right now. I'll explain what that means. But just at least if, if you can contain yourself not changing your way of life until Monday, that'll be helpful. Maybe we'll explain a little bit. <laughs> now we understand how the table could bring atonement because when I eat food by my table, it does the same thing like a carbon. But the difference is a carbon actually has an effect on the whole universe. When a person brought a carbon to the base of Mikdash, it affected every single place in the whole world, and it affected all the spiritual worlds. Now, the Rebbe explains that it had an effect on Atzilus and Bri and Yitzira. All the spiritual worlds were affected because this is the base of Mikdash, the center of the universe. When I eat by my table, it has mainly an effect on me personally, locally. Yes, whatever I do with myself, has a ripple effect on the rest of the world, but the direct impact is on me. And of course, it's not as high as it is with the Beis Hamikdash. That's definitely on a high level, but it's the same principle, the same idea. A person needs to be extremely careful with his eating. She that his kavana should be lahalis and itzutzus the toyush of the the, uh, the intention should be to elevate the sparks in the food by eating the Shem Shemayim. Not to eat just to uh, satisfy the taiva, in other words, just for the sake of pleasure. So basically what he's saying is, the reason why we need caution is because when I eat food, one of the two things can happen. Either I elevate the food to a higher level, which eventually elevates me, or the opposite could happen. Instead of me elevating the food, the food brings me down, makes me more coarse. Because I, I uh, did not focus on the right thing. I got caught up in the pleasure of the gosh, food. And in that case, I'm benefiting from the food. Moshemta once told his students that where is the place found where his will is, where his desire is, which means a person's physically in one place, but their mind and their heart is another place. They're more there than they are here. I think it was the Friedrich Rebbe that said that there was once a child in the cheder that was sitting in the cheder, wasn't paying attention, and he was looking out the window, I guess there was a bird on a branch looking at kids, you know, looking out the window, watching what's happening. So his teacher told him, you know, if you'd be sitting outside looking in, you'd be here more than sitting in and looking out. Because a person is where his mind and his heart is, not where he is physically. So therefore, it's very uh, effective when a person has a rutz and even a desire for Torah, for mitzvahs, for spirituality, 
Having a desire to be in a certain place already brings you to that place. And having a desire and a passion for the opposite brings you to that place. So one time, the Vashem and a student were sitting by the table and he told the students to close their eyes and they should all put their hands on the other person's shoulders. And he put his hands on the two students next to him and they formed a human chain. And this happened a number of times. And I Yom Yom, there's a story with something like that, which basically meant that by them doing that, they connected to the Baal Shem Tov, and he enabled them to see or to hear what he sees or what he hears. So in this story, they're sitting by the table and all of a sudden they <coughs> all gasped. They saw an ox sitting by the table. <coughs> an ox, there wasn't never an ox here by the table. And they opened their eyes, but Shemzo said, there's someone sitting by the table that his passion is more the meat than the spiritual purpose in eating the meat. So it's, it's meat of, a, of, a, of an ox, of a cow. So basically, because his passion wasn't what he was eating, that's what became. But with physical eyes, you don't see it. But when they were able to see things through those Shemto's eyes, they saw what it looked like. You are what you eat. You are what you eat, right. <clears throat> so you can choose to become a turkey, a chicken, a cow, goat. <laughs> So it's either I lift the food or the food brings me down. So in a sense, this is the war that we're talking about. But it's, more, it's deeper than that. Now, the reason why I'm not going to go into your question, because I need more time to explain it. And uh, maybe we'll soon explain it. I wanted to take a little break. Again, we have the same problem like last week with our lovely teacher cannot come in. So I'm sorry, I'll have to um, move a little bit, you know, keep going. And I want to... If we have time, I'll do more of the Maimah, but I want to take a few moments to talk about Test Kiss of Yud Kiss. So these are the booklets, and it's a short, little short uh, bio, a little bit about the Mitzvah Rebbe. You can put it on the table, you can take it and read it. And I just want to say a few words about the Mitzvah Rebbe. We mentioned this at night when we had the event, Wednesday night in the dorm. That on one hand, all the Rebbe's of Chabad are one continuation. Whoever understands properly Chassidus and the teachings of Chassidus and understands properly what it says about the Rebbe's of Chabad and about spreading Chassidus, will see that each Rebbe was a continuation, sort of took it from where the previous Rebbe left off and continued it and it, and it went out further. Oh, does somebody want to tell those students that the Allah teaches that here? Okay, no, 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 no. What? They went to my wire. No, okay. Just, yeah. Thank you.